Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another video on the Cold War. This one's going to be the last one in our series about the Cold War. This one's going to be about the end of the Cold War. And so really, when we start with the end of the Cold War, one of the things we have to start with is, of course, President Reagan from the United States. In 1980, President Reagan won the presidency of the United States and, of course, was sworn in in 1981. Now, Reagan was a very different kind of a president. From the beginning of the Cold War and Harry Truman, what we saw was the policy of containment. People thought that communism was such a bad idea that eventually it would collapse in on itself. People would go broke and they wouldn't produce enough products and the whole country would just disintegrate. As long as we stopped communism from spreading, the thought was it would eventually take itself out of the equation and it would no longer be able to survive. But if it continued to spread and to get more resources, ultimately we would see communism becoming a larger and a larger problem. But really since the time of World War II, the, the playbook was let's just keep playing defense. Let's play defense in Greece and Turkey in 1949. Let's try to play defense after communism takes over in China when it comes to places like Korea and Vietnam. Let's try to stop that from spreading. Let's try to stop it from spreading in Africa. Let's try to stop it from spreading in Latin America. That was the thought process up until the 1970s. And then in the 1970s, if you'll remember, we got the policy of detente. Well, instead of trying to stop it, let's see if we can learn how to live together and kind of relax tensions and learn how to peacefully coexist. When we get to the 1980s, President Reagan is a very different president and he is no longer willing to accept containment policy. He says containment doesn't work because it hasn't been working since 1947. Instead, what he decided to do is he said, when I become the president of the United States, I am going to be aggressive when it comes to the Soviet Union and when it comes to communism and we're going to try to defeat communism in communist countries and we're going to try to take the fight to the Soviet Union. We're going to try to bring down what he called the evil empire and everything when it came to Reagan was about defeating communism and making the United States and capitalism and freedom and democracy the only option left in the world because ultimately he felt that communism was the greatest evil that had ever been unleashed on man. And of course he's looking at, you know, 110 million Chinese people being murdered, a third of the Cambodians being murdered by their own government, the huge loss of life in the Soviet Union during the Civil War and during the Stalin era and just he's looking at this pile of bodies and saying that communism is a bad system and we should try to get rid of it. Now, President Reagan actually gets a really good opportunity to do this because in 1979, the Soviet Union had started the process of invading the country of Afghanistan because, of course, they were trying to still get access to warm water port, they're trying to get access to more resources, they're trying to expand the influence of the Soviet Union. Now, one of the things that's really important to remember about the Soviet Union is that officially the country was an atheist country, which means they do not subscribe to any particular religion and they do not profess a belief in a god. The government itself was officially atheist, even though many of the people in the Soviet Union were still religious, they weren't necessarily encouraged to follow and practice their religion. Officially, the Soviet Union was supposed to be an atheist country. When they invaded Afghanistan, though, they found that being an atheist country invading Afghanistan was going to give them quite a lot of problems because the vast majority of people in Afghanistan were, and still are, Muslims. They follow the religion of Islam. And they perceived the Soviet invasion as a holy war, as a jihad. And so they called on, on good and holy Muslims from all over the world to come to Afghanistan to try to defend Islam. And they became what we call the Mujahideen, which is Muslim holy warriors, people who are fighting for their religion. These Mujahideen, however, were very under-equipped and very underfunded and very poor, and they, they were fighting against professional Soviet soldiers, and it wasn't going very well. 
one of the huge problems was a lot of these guys were using old World War I bolt-action rifles against the sophisticated and modern Soviet military. And one of the things the Soviet military really used to great, very great effect in, in Afghanistan was the Mi-24 Hind attack helicopter. This weapon system was absolutely devastating to the Mujahideen. And, you know, it allowed the Soviet Union to hide behind uh, uh, mountains and then to pop up out of nowhere while they were out in the middle of a valley and to just mow them down with its rockets and its guided missiles and its machine guns. And it's, it's an absolutely devastating weapon system. Once President Reagan got into office, he looked at the situation and using the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, he decided that it would be great if we could support the Mujahideen and give them some training and give them some money and give them some technological advances that would help them to defeat the Soviet Union. Because he said, listen, if the Soviet Union gets bogged down in Afghanistan, if they start losing lots of soldiers and spending lots of money on this conflict, it really weakens the Soviet Union itself and it makes things very difficult for them. And that, of course, is exactly his plan. One of the things that they do, and this is just one of the things that they do, is they send the Mujahideen FIM-92 Stinger missiles, which are shoulder-fired heat and laser-guided missile systems that allow small units, really two-man units, to launch these missiles, and they're what we call fire and forget. Once you shoot them at your target, you can turn around and run, and that missile is going to guide itself to that helicopter. And all over Afghanistan, Soviet helicopters start to come down, which is excellent for the people of Afghanistan and also excellent for the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union starts to view Afghanistan, and the United States did our best to make Afghanistan, the Soviet Union's Vietnam. It's a very long-lasting war. It's a very costly war in terms of money and time and human lives that are lost and Soviet soldiers that are killed in the conflict. All of those things get wrapped up and become, this is one of the features that, that puts the Soviet Union kind of on, on its heels. It's backing up. It's not having a good time. It's not advancing. It's not gaining power. It's really losing power. While this is also going on, a couple of other things that are happening. In the country of Poland, we get a guy named Lech Walesa, who starts to lead a pro-democracy labor union called Solidarity. They go on strike. They... Uh, protest in favor of increasing wages and increasing rights and increasing union operations. And really they start to draw the attention of people in Eastern Europe to the idea that the Communist Party is really not solving any of our problems. They're really making our problems worse. And we would very much like it if we could get rid of the Communist Party in Poland. Now, they were stopped in the early part of the 1980s, but again, this is kind of chipping away at this larger mountain to slowly, slowly, slowly erode the power that the Soviet Union has. So again, solidarity in Poland is another kind of brick in the wall of getting rid of the Soviet Union and getting rid of communism. In 1984, inside of the Soviet Union itself, another major change came when we got a new pri uh, premier of the Soviet Union. His name was Mikhail Gorbachev. He was actually a relatively young guy. He had actually grown up in the Soviet Union his whole life under Stalin's communism. And really, he was a reformer. He looked, he believed in communism. He really did believe in the equality of people and, and you know, communist ideology. But he also said, we need to change communism communism so that it actually works. Because by the time you get to 1984, the Soviet Union's having money problems. The Soviet Union is having production problems. The Soviet Union is, of course, caught up in this war in Afghanistan that's causing it military problems. You've got people in other ethnic uh, identities in the uh, Soviet Union that want independence. And, and it's just the, the whole system is kind of starting to crumble. And so he says, let's see if we can make some changes that will ultimately allow communism to continue to be successful. The two reforms that he makes, the first one is called perestroika. Perestroika is an economic restructuring of the Soviet Union, and what he starts to do is he reaches all the way back to Lenin's new economic program is really where he gets the idea from, and he says what we'll do is we will allow people to start owning small businesses, local flower shop, local bakery, local things like that, to allow them to then, when they produce, if they are popular, 
And if people enjoy purchasing their products, we will allow them to keep a lot of the profit that their businesses generate. And what that does is it gives people the incentive to work really, really super hard to be able to get wealthy and to be able to provide for their families even better and to be able to move up in socioeconomic status. Now, most of you, of course, recognize exactly what that means, too. You let people take a risk and you let them keep the reward when the reward pays off. Gorbachev's idea of how to fix communism is basically make it capitalism, right? Now, that's only on a small scale. He's not talking about privatizing industries, you know, the steel mills and the farms and things like that. He's still talking about a centrally planned economy, but with small scale elements of capitalism, and that really helps to get the Soviet economy going again, which is excellent, but again, it's a perfect lesson for you. The best way to fix communism is to make it into capitalism, and that's not the last time we're going to see that happen. Now, at the same time that Gorbachev is doing perestroika and economically restructuring the Soviet Union, he also adopts a policy which is called glasnost. Glasnost is a Russian word that means openness. And what he's talking about is, since the time of Stalin, the Soviet Union has been a very closed society where they don't talk about their problems and you're not allowed to criticize the government and you're not allowed to talk about when things go wrong and you're, you're, you're really a, a closed society when it comes to politics and culture and you just don't, you don't talk about things publicly. Gorbachev says, listen, if we don't talk about the problems, if we don't let people tell the government what it's doing wrong, there's no way we can possibly fix those problems. And so ultimately, he starts to promote this idea of glasnost. Let's allow people to write letters to the newspaper that criticize the government. Let's allow people to point out our mistakes. Let's allow this cultural and political openness. Both of these reform movements are interesting because they afford people a little bit of power. And we've seen in the course of this class, when you give people a little bit of power, what they start to expect is more. And they start demanding more and more and more power. And this is really one of the things that is going to ultimately start to bring down the Soviet Union. When people experience freedom for the first time in two generations, they like it and they want more of it and they absolutely start to chip away and erode the power that the Soviet Union's government has over their lives. And by this time, the Soviet Union is financially not in a good position. They're, you know, they're, they're getting hammered in the war in Afghanistan and everything is starting to fall apart. Now, by the end of the 1980s, that's when we start getting to the falling apart part. Here we see a map that shows the dates of collapse of the communist governments in each of these Soviet satellite states. And really the place that we're going to start is in Germany. In 1987, President Reagan actually went to Western Berlin, the city of West Berlin, the free side of West of, of Berlin, and standing at the Brandenburg Gate, which is which was part of the Berlin Wall, he made a speech in which he he encouraged Premier Gorbachev to tear down this wall. He talked about it as being a scar that carves its way across the European continent and divides people who should otherwise enjoy the freedom that people in West Berlin were able to enjoy. Now remember, at this time, Berlin is still a divided city with a wall running right between the two sides of it. West Berlin is like Las Vegas. You can do anything. You can buy anything. It's a, it's a hugely successful and prosperous capitalist democracy. But it's also completely and totally surrounded by the country of East Germany, which is a communist country and suffering horribly under communism. In 1987, President Reagan encourages Premier Gorbachev to tear down the Berlin Wall and to allow Germany to heal itself and to come back together as one unified city, one unified country, and then, of course, one Europe. That was the goal. In October of 1989, and, and to be perfectly honest, people are still not entirely certain of how this event actually happened. But in October of 1989, an order went out to the East German border guards on the Berlin Wall to allow people to cross it, to allow people into West Berlin, to allow people to leave the communist 
zone. And and people really didn't understand, you know, exactly what that meant. And the first day there was a lot, you know, people were unwilling to do that. They, they thought, well, if I cross the border now, they're going to shoot me because they're going to say that I'm trying to escape and I don't have the, the legal documentation to cross the border. However, the next day, of course, people realized that, no, we're allowed to cross the border. The mistake isn't being corrected. The mistake isn't being fixed. And in the first, like, seven days, over two million people crossed the wall, crossed the border from East Berlin to West Berlin, and they, they just, they couldn't believe what capitalism had produced in West Berlin. They couldn't believe the luxury. They couldn't believe the options. They couldn't believe what was available as a result of the capitalist system. And many people said, we don't want to go home. I don't want to go back to a communist country after I've seen what it's like living in a capitalist utopia, basically, is the way that these people look at it. By December of 1989, the the decision was that they there was a very high level meeting between the United States and the Soviet Union, and President well at this time it would have been President Bush. President Bush asked uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. He said, "What do you intend to do about Germany? Is is are we going to allow them to unify together now that we've had this mistake in Berlin?" And President Gorbachev or Premier Gorbachev responded with, well, I guess it's kind of up to the Germans, which means if the Germans decide to unify, the Germans are allowed to unify. And that really in 1989 was the, the kind of impetus for now the reunification of Germany, whereas Germany has been divided since 1945. And people start to tear, like literally overnight, they start to tear down the wall. People are out there with pickaxes and hammers and they start tearing down the Berlin Wall, unifying not only Berlin, but also Germany, and creating now a newly unified and independent country of Germany, which is going to eventually happen officially in 19. 90. However, some other really important events are happening again at almost the same time. This 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 whole process of of the fall of the Soviet Union and the fall of communism in Eastern Europe happens really 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 incredibly quickly. From the end of 1989, we also get in the country of Czechoslovakia a man named Vakalov Havel who won the presidency of Czechoslovakia and started and he ran as an anti-communist. Not only did he win and peacefully decommunize the country of Czechoslovakia and remove the communist government, but also for the the point of this is that he he starts a process called the Velvet Revolution. And the reason they call it the Velvet Revolution is it's not a violent revolution. It's not a violent military overthrow. They actually didn't kill anybody to unify Germany. Nobody had to die to free Czechoslovakia. Nobody had to die. Eventually, in 1992, the Czech people and the Slovakian people looked at each other and said, you know what, we were forced to be together after World War I, and it's not that we don't like each other, because they actually do get along relatively well. They just decided that nationalism was a bigger thing, and the Czech people wanted their own country, and the Slovakian people wanted their own country. So after they overthrew communism in 1989, in 1992, they sat down like adult people and negotiated themselves in splitting in 1992 into the Czech Republic and Slovakia. So not only did they peacefully overthrow communism, they also peacefully separated their countries without having to kill anybody, which again is absolutely amazing when we consider the full history of the world that we've done so far. It's very, very rare that people do that. The next country on our list that we've got to deal with is the country of Romania in 1989. In Romania, we had a dictator named Nicolae Ceausescu. Now, Ceausescu was a really big problem for Romania because he basically had a fifth grade education, but he was the dictator of the country. And really what he did was he ran that country in such a horrible way that people were really not happy with him, and particularly not with his wife as well, because they bankrupted Romania. In December of 1981, he ordered the arrest of a priest, and that became such a flashpoint for the people. They were so unhappy with the government over the ordering of the arrest of this priest that in December, on December 21st of 1989, when he was giving his yearly announcement, his Christmas announcement to the nation, people in, in Bucharest started to boo him. And 
he he continued his speech for a while and he he gave orders to some of his security forces but the longer he talked the more nervous he became until eventually he left the podium in the middle of his speech and he tried to flee the country with his wife he was arrested his wife and he were put on trial for what they had done to romania and then they were executed by firing squad so in romania it's not a completely bloodless revolution they do kill the dictator they do kill the dictator's wife but otherwise they overthrow the country and they overthrow communism without much bloodshed right the, the dictator and his wife yes but other than that it's not a huge violent armed revolution it's not a war when we look at the rest of this, you'll see that from 1989 to 1990, basically all of the Eastern European satellite states get independence. They overthrow their communist overlords. They overthrow communism and become newly independent democratic countries. But also what you'll notice is inside the Soviet Union, the same thing starts to happen in 1990 and 1991. Now, you have to remember that this was a 45-year-long Cold War. And all of a sudden, in about a year and a half, we go from a situation where the Cold War is still, you know, absolutely a thing that everyone's worried about, and, oh, there's going to be a nuclear war, and this is really scary, to all of a sudden Germany's being reunified. All of a sudden, Poland is independent. All of a sudden, Romania is independent. All of a sudden, the Czech Republic is independent, and Hungary is independent, and Bulgaria is independent. And then all of a sudden, you know, countries inside the Soviet Union are starting to get independent too. And, and it, it happened so incredibly quickly that people went from a Cold War mindset that they had had for 45 years to, well, what's going on with the Soviet Union? Now, the really, really interesting part is you'll see there inside the Soviet Union, the thing that really kills the Soviet Union was nationalism. All of the different pieces, all of the different ethnic groups within the Soviet Union finally in 1990 decided they would much rather have their own national identities and their own national governments. The guy we're looking at right now is Boris Yeltsin. He is Russia's very first ever democratically elected leader. He was elected to be the leader of the Russian Soviet in 1990, and basically what he started to push for was Russian nationalism. That Russian nationalism really starts to kill the Soviet Union because you can't be unified together and all equal if you're ultimately going to be Russians and Kazakhs and Ukrainians and, and all of the other groups of people. But he really starts this process of dismantling the Soviet Union in 1991. In August of 1991, some old hard, you know, hardcore communists came out and tried to overthrow the government. But ultimately, it was the people of Russia that came out in the streets and protested protested this, this communist overthrow and ultimately saved the revolution against the communist party and, and protected their newfound democracy. On August the 24th, the communist party of the Soviet Union was dissolved as a political entity. On December 26th of 1991, the Soviet Union itself dissolved and produced a collection of new countries, Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, Belarus, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. We refer to these countries as the Commonwealth of Independent States. They still have a very close, or at least they had a very close relationship with Russia, but now they're not part of the Soviet Union anymore. Now they are fully independent countries. Many of them become democracies, all of them start to move, well, most of them at least start to move away from Soviet-style communism into capitalism, into democracy, and into really the modern world. So, all you know, we go from a position where there's a mistake at the border between in West Berlin and East Berlin at the Berlin Wall. There's a mistake in the late, very late part of 1989, and by the end of 1991, the Cold War is over. It happened so incredibly quickly. Most people didn't even understand what was happening, and all of a sudden, one day in the newspaper, it was the 
Soviet Union's gone and the Cold War's over and people really didn't know how to handle that. We really didn't know what to do next because we had been so focused on the Cold War for so long. So I hope that this video was informative for you. I hope that it's helping you to understand how the Cold War ended. In the next unit, we're going to talk about the emergence of new nations during the Cold War, the creation of new countries in the middle part of the, the 20th century, and we'll, we'll deal with unit 11 uh, in the next series of videos. So as always, leave a like, uh, subscribe for notifications of new videos, uh, leave comments below, and of course if you have any questions, feel free to email me, send me a message on Google Classroom, and uh, stay healthy and stay safe everybody.